Let's hear from God's Word. Well, I'm so glad to be with you this morning, and this is an incredible week. As you know, this is Easter week, and uh, as we move towards Easter, all kinds of things uh, we'll, we'll be observing here. By the way, Friday night, we'll be having a cross service right here in this room, and I encourage you at 7 p.m. to come and bring people with you. The truth is that almost nobody has plans for Good Friday. If you uh, ask someone, do you already have plans for Good Friday? Most of them say no. And uh, it's a great opportunity for bring them. For those of you that don't know, by the way, how many of you have never been to the cross service? You've never been to it before? Would you raise your hand? So there's a good number of people in here that have it. So let me explain what, what happens. At the, at the cross service, we have uh, a service where we remember the cross. And I actually bring a cross in. I bring a tree in that's 20 feet long. And uh, 13 feet constitutes the main beam, 7 feet uh, the cross beam. I actually chopped the cross while I preached the story of the cross. And so all kinds of axes and wood and, and chips are flying everywhere. But it's a great way for us to remember the cross and remember the significance of what really took place. The cross is not a piece of jewelry. The cross is not emblazoned on a T-shirt. The cross was an instrument of death and uh, an instrument of agony as well. So we walked through that on that Friday night, and uh, I promise you it'll be unforgettable, and uh, people will come with you if you'll invite them. So please come, and then, of course, Easter Sunday morning. But I do want to say one more thing about another event. That's the Healthy Home Conference. Healthy Home is our conference where we are uh, in an ongoing way, passing on faith to the next generation. And it's our effort to be prepared to do that. Uh, and the conference is our chance to focus on one of the key components of a healthy home. Now, by home, I do not mean husband, wife, and children, even though it can also include that. Every individual lives in a home. You have a head, you have a heart. And healthy home is really about having the, the key components of knowing your faith well and knowing how to pass it on to the next generation, whether that's your children or whether that's passing it on to someone younger than you that needs to know about the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ. So on that day, it starts at 8.30 in the morning, goes to about 3 in the afternoon. So you come to church, but you really get a conference when you come to church. We have breakouts. We have lunch provided with RSVPs. And so we want you to get on the website and look at all of the breakouts. And I promise you there will be two or three of those that you're going to want to go to. But two breakout sessions are happening, one at 9.30, one at 1 p.m., and then we have some big events at 11 o'clock, just like a worship service at 11 o'clock on a normal Sunday morning. Les Parrott, a relationship expert and author, will be here uh, in order to speak those relationship principles to us and then back again at 2 p.m. in the afternoon. So please come, plan to stay, um, and you're going to have an incredible experience that will help you know how to have a healthy relationships, because that's the first component we're going to be dealing with. May 1st, mark it on your calendar, invite people to come with you. If you have your Bibles, please take them and turn to 1 Corinthians 15 today. 1 Corinthians 15. This is going to be a very unusual message in terms of content. I'm going to share some things with you we never, ever, ever talk about, and that has to do with a resurrection body. We're going to talk today about your glorified body. If you're a believer in Jesus, you're going to have good news coming to you because your body that you have right now is not your final destination. It's not your final vehicle. Aren't you glad to know that? Now, the older the person is, the louder the amen is. We're really glad to know that if we're beyond, say, 30 years of age. If you're 30 in the prime of life, it gets better. I promise you, it really does get better. Let's stand together as we read 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'm going to begin uh, reading in verse 35. Paul's dealing with the resurrection of Jesus and the resurrection of believers after they die. And so he says in verse 35, But someone will say, How are the dead raised? And with what kind of body do they come? Now those two questions that Paul is posing here, he's going to give the answers to in the following verses. He begins by saying, You fool, that which you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And that which you sow, you do not sow the body which is to be but a bare grain, perhaps of a wheat or of something else. But God gives to the body just as he wished, and to each of the seeds a body of its own. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there's one flesh of men and another, fl another flesh of beasts and another flesh of birds and another of fish. There are also heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is one. And the glory of the earthly is another. There is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars, for star differs 
from star and glory. Now you can see he's explaining this to people that don't understand the resurrection from the dead. And it's perfectly understandable. We don't see people rise from the dead very often. <laughs> Verse 42. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown a perishable body. It is raised an imperishable body. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So also it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam, we know that to be Jesus, the last Adam, a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, then the spiritual. The first man is from the earth, earthy. The second man is from heaven. As is the earthy, so also are those who are earthy. As is the heavenly, so also are those who are heavenly. Just as we have borne the image of the earthy, we will also bear the image of the heavenly. Lots of details here. Father, in Jesus' name, give us illumination, insight, excitement about the days ahead. Father, I pray that you'll help us conceptualize in our mind what we're never able to adequately think about because this is the reality that's coming according to your promise. Thank you for it. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. amen. Be seated, please, if you would. You know, we're fascinated by the human body. You and I are fascinated by the human body. We really are. And for a good reason. This is our vehicle that we live in right here and now. I mean, we've got to take care of it. We've got to make sure it's functioning well. And so we do all kinds of things with our body. We feed it, we rest it, we wash it, we treat it, we fix it when it's broken, we dress it, we work it out, we show it off, we hide it, we care for it, we compare it. It's our vehicle for life. But as time goes on, these bodies grow older. Somebody say, oh me, because that's really true. Now, some of you in this room haven't experienced that yet. I promise you one day it's going to happen. When I was 30 years old, I could not conceive of the fact that my body would grow a little bit older, but lo and behold, it does that. It does that for everybody. You're not going to be the exception. At some point, our body begins to function differently, and at some point, our bodies began to disappoint us. I was doing some research this past week of all the money we spend on our bodies, and I just did several different searches and, uh, and found some amazing numbers when I added them all up. I asked the question, how much money do we spend on an annual or a lifetime basis for health care? What do we spend over a lifetime for cosmetics? What do we spend for medicine? What do we spend for physical fitness? What do we spend for our hair and hair product? What do we spend? You'll be amazed to know that the average human being spends, in America, they spend a million dollars over their lifetime on all those things pertaining to their body. Now, that's not even including food. Now think about that. We spend a million dollars over our lifetime making our bodies the best possible vehicle that we can have. Did you know that this next year more than one million people will elect to have plastic surgery because they want to improve their body. They want to do something to make sure that their body is as good as it possibly can be. So it's a high maintenance thing, keeping this body awake, keeping this body alive. It's a big deal. It costs a lot of money. But the good news that we have for you is our earthly bodies are not our final vehicle. Don't hold on to it too tightly because at one point the Bible says we will be physically recreated. At some point, the believer in Jesus Christ will have a brand new body. There's a, there's a spiritual principle I want to talk about just a little bit today, and here it is. The fullness of life is not on this side of the grave, but on the other side of the grave. That's why we need to think about this just a little bit. And you know, I think it's hard to think about a glorified body. It's hard for me to think about the resurrection body because we're so used to the bodies we have. We're so used to the limitations we have. We're so used to the body living for a while and then dying. And we're, we're just used to that. That's just normal. That's what happens. And face it, the last resurrection and resurrection body we heard about was 2,000 years ago. Right? So it's been a while since someone has risen from the dead and shown us what a resurrection body looks like. So we don't think about this very much. We don't, we don't dwell on it very much. It's hard for us to get our arms around this kind of thing. But because it is our eternal destination, it's an important thing to think about, an encouraging thing to know. So Paul answers a couple of questions about the resurrection body. By the way, he, he refers 
to the word body 12 times in the verses we read. 12 times. Anytime you see repetition in Scripture, you know what the subject is. It's that word right there. It's the word body. As always giving us insight and information, and he answers two questions. First of all, how will the resurrection happen? Now, when I first hear this question, I think, okay, I'm going to hear some details about how this happens physically, but Paul doesn't really answer how it happens physically because Paul's not capable of answering that question. But what he does say is that several things happen that help you know about death. And he says, basically, basically, it will happen by death. Resurrection happens because death happens. He says in verse 36, that which you sow does not come to life and, unless it dies. So that's a very simple thing. You get a resurrection body because you will have a body in the afterlife, but you will get one because your earthly body will die. You've been given a body that you have today. Your mother and your father uh, gave you this body. The DNA gave you this body. But one day God will create a new body for you, and that body will be totally recreated. That's why we don't need as believers to fear death. Because something better is on the other side. And I don't just mean the heavenly existence. I mean the actual body that we are in. But we shouldn't be afraid of it. We've had this body for our time on earth. But we get a new body for our time in heaven. And it's much greater than anything we will have had on earth. By the way, it's important for you and I to anticipate that. I do a lot of funerals. More funerals than I would ever have anticipated doing. But the way people who are believers in Jesus, who know that, the, that the, those in Christ will rise to a new life forever and ever and have a glorified body, the way they face death and others face death is night and day. I watch the faces of people who know that for a person who is a believer in Jesus, to die right now is to be present with Christ. And there's hope all over their face during the funeral service. They know that that person is not in that body anymore, that they are with the Lord and will receive a glorified body. It's an amazing thing. But when I watch people who don't believe in resurrection, who don't believe in Christ, and that friend of theirs, that loved one has died, then that is the final stop. That's the dead end. It's the full stop. And it's heartless and hopeless to think about anything else. Paul wants us to know about what's next because of the hope and the encouragement and the joy we get when we know that God has a plan beyond death. But death is the starting point for your glorified body. And by the way, God creates this new body himself. It's completely recreated, and it doesn't matter how you died. People ask me this question all the time. Is creation a big deal? Is that addressed in the Bible? What happens to people who die by some horrible physical trauma? What about those that donate the organ? In other words, will anything be missing in a resurrected body? And my answer is always the same. The God who spoke and caused the dust to come together in order to make Adam and then Eve it's the same God that's going to give you a recreated body. It doesn't matter how you die. It doesn't matter whether you're cremated. It doesn't matter whether you're buried in the ground. It doesn't matter what happened at your death. You're still going to get a glorified body as a follower of Jesus. There won't be anything missing. He'll have everything taken into account. But death is the necessity that happens before the resurrection. Then he says it'll happen by design. Notice he says in verse 37, you do not sow the body which is to be but a bare grain. That's Paul's ability and his, his desire to say, look, what you have right now is just a seed. What you'll have later on is so much greater, so much more fitting in the resurrected body than your body is right now. What you have is just a foretaste of that great resurrected body that you'll have one day. It's like a seed compared to the fruit. Now, you know my story. I, I, as a kid, I was given some acreage by my father who said plant pecans on that, on that farm. And so I planted some pecans. I planted 100 pecan trees with about three pecans each in the hole, and I watered them. And now all these years later, these pecan trees are massive. They're massive. I'm building furniture out of those pecan trees today, actually. But when I planted those pecans, I just had the bare seed, just the pecans. Dropped it in the ground. But what came out of the ground was something so much more glorious, so much bigger, so much more massive, so many pecans. But I recognized it as that same seed that came out. And Paul is using an agricultural illustration to say, your body is just the better seed. What comes out is the full plant. I mean, that's what your glorified body is going to be like. So much 
more awesome than anything you could ever have on earth. And then he says it happens by distinction. In other words, there are also heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is one, the glory of the earthly is another, and the emphasis is on distinction. He, he compares men with beasts and birds and fish, and there's so much difference, so much distinction. He compares the, uh, the sun with the moon, stars, again, so much different. And basically, he's saying, look, when you get this glorified body, it is so much radically different than what you have, so superior to anything you've ever experienced or ever could. It is to be anticipated. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to anticipate what happens on the other side of death with this promise of a glorified body. Try to get your mind made up for that. And when you grow weaker, when you grow weary, and when you grow tired, and when you're wondering about how much longer you have left on this earth, you need to keep in mind there's another chapter, and it's a better one than you could ever imagine. Amen. That's what Paul's saying. There's no comparison with what you have now and what you will have then. So how does it happen? Well, Paul just gives us those clues, and then he answers the question, what kind of body will we have? And that's where he gets into the details. I want to tell you today what the Bible says about your glorified body, and it's good news. He says in verse 42, so also is the resurrection of the dead. Now, bear with me for just a moment because I want you to know that we can read the Bible and find different angles, different perspectives, all of them in alignment with what a glorified body will look like. For example, John in 1 John 3, 2 says, Beloved, we are children of God, and he has not appeared to us as yet what we will be in the future. We know that when he appears, that is when Christ appears, we will be like him, for we will see him just as he is. That's a powerful statement. John says, and John, remember, saw the resurrected, glorified Jesus. He says, we don't know exactly what we'll be like, but we know we'll be like him, and I've seen him. So have hope in that because I've seen him. And we're going to become like him. We'll be just like Jesus. Now, whenever you look at the resurrected Jesus and all that he did after he died and three days later rose again from the dead, it gives us some clues about what our glorified body will look like. By the way, a number of people saw Jesus. If you're thinking that only one or two people saw Jesus resurrected from the dead, you would be absolutely wrong. For example... On Resurrection Day, he appeared five different times to 16 different people. Did you know that? Over the next 39 days, he appeared six more times to 520 people. In fact, Paul writes to the church at Corinth, more than 500 at one time saw him, and many of them are still alive. Go ask them. They're eyewitnesses. Over the next few months, he appeared six times to four different people. He revealed himself. He ate with people. He was touched by the disciples. He showed them his wounds. They saw his resurrected body. They recognized him. He revealed himself to them in so many different ways. And surprisingly, Paul, the apostle Paul, who's writing this letter, saw Jesus four different times. I learned that this week. Now, we know Paul saw Jesus on the road to Damascus where he was confronted by Jesus and he, he was actually blinded and fell and turned and began to follow Jesus. But he also saw him in Galatia, where he was taught not by men, but by Jesus. And he saw him in Acts 22, the Bible says, at the Jerusalem temple. And then when he was in prison at Caesarea, the, the Lord came and stood alongside him. Acts 23 says that. Four times Paul saw Jesus in his resurrected form. He had a very good idea of what a resurrected body looked like because he saw Jesus. So when he describes the resurrection and the resurrection body, Paul knows what he's talking about. You say, well, I have some other ideas of what a, what a resurrection body looks like. Have you ever seen a resurrection body? And the answer is no, you haven't. I'm going to trust what he says more than what you say. Amen. And I'm not going to trust what I say because I didn't see a resurrected Jesus either, but Paul did. So what does he say? I'm going to give you five words that describe what he says in these verses. And the first word is the word eternal. Someone say eternal. 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 Look in verse 42. It is sown, like that seed, your earthly body is sown, a perishable body. It is raised an imperishable body. 
Now, what does that mean? Well, we know what perishable means. It means it has a date beyond which it's not good anymore, an expiration date. Someday you will expire, right? Most of you, most of you women at least, look at the expiration date on the package in the refrigerator. The guys just eat it, you know, hope for the best, right? But the expiration date says it's not good after this moment. You and I have a perishable body. Now, we don't know how long we'll live. Now, God does know. He has numbered your days. He knows the end from the beginning. He knows how long you'll live. You don't, but you know at some point you will die. Now, that's good news for you because what's on the other side. So we have an expiration date. We're perishable, but the Bible says that the resurrection body will be the opposite of that, imperishable. That means ageless. Somebody say, hello, ageless. That means it will not decay. It will not wrinkle. It'll not get old. It'll not grow weak. It will not break down. It will not get sick. It is imperishable. I don't know how you're not thinking this is good news, folks. My goodness, this is amazing. It's raised imperishable. And all the aging that we're used to and the sickness and the pain and all the things that break our heart about our body we'll never see again in the afterlife. In Revelation chapter 21, it's describing heaven and it says, And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will no longer be any death, no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. And all that we've experienced on this planet will be replaced by a new body that's imperishable, unaging, healthy, and whole. Your best life is not now. It is later. Amen. Later. Because of what's happening with your glorified body. Now, some people ask this question, how old will we be in heaven since we're eternal and since we're timeless and ageless? How, how old will everybody be? And although we don't know the answer completely, many Bible scholars have weighed in on that with their best, with their best attempts to this. And, and most of them say you'll be at the prime of life at the age of about 30 or something like that. Jesus died at the age of 33 and the insinuation is we'll become like Jesus in some form, and even though it doesn't describe all aspects of that form, most scholars would say that that's the best answer, about 30 years of age, about the prime of life. And I like that idea from a biblical perspective, but I also like the idea from a guy that's more than twice 30 years old. I think that's pretty good news. I mean, that's kind of the prime of life for many people. That's when you felt the best, when you did the most. Now, imagine what that means for people that are aged and have long passed that age where life is comfortable and now they're experiencing pain and their body is breaking down maybe they've experienced disease in their lifetime maybe they've had cancer maybe they have all kinds of physical problems and to think that you'll have a glorified body and it'll be in the prime of life is so encouraging think about those who lost children to death at birth or at a young age or whose child died in the womb. And to be able to see in them and recognize them and acknowledge them at the prime age of life, what an anticipation that would be. To know that we'll see people that were on the planet but in the prime of life and to be able to identify with them in the sense that we know who they are, we walk with them or we were somehow connected to them. And by the way, there's every indication that we will recognize each other in the afterlife just as people recognized Jesus. They didn't immediately recognize him, but they all eventually recognized him as Jesus. So we're recognizable even though we're greater than what we were on this planet in terms of our body, just as I recognize a pecan tree that came from a pecan that went into the ground. That bare little seed went in, the huge tree came up, and at this point, the Scripture says that we'll see and recognize those with glorified bodies and recognize them from before. And just like the tree was bigger, greater, more glorious, but still a pecan tree, we'll be recognizable. We'll keep our sexual identities. The Scripture says that if you're a man on earth, you'll be a man in eternity. If you're a woman on earth, you'll be a woman in eternity. Your names will be the same. Even though you'll be given new names in heaven, you retain your other names as well. Our distinguishing features are recognizable, and our unique talents are recognizable. In short, you're still you because your, unique, your God's unique 
creation, but you, you are you perfected. You are you more perfect than anything you could possibly imagine. Someone says, well, that's really good news because I want my spouse to be more perfect than they are, and in heaven they will be. <laughs> Except there is no marrying and giving in marriage in heaven. There is no reproducing in heaven. I think I told you this before. Uh, I preached the text about no marriage in heaven, and uh, I had an assistant at the time who was much older than I was, and she said to me, or she said in the worship service, that when I mentioned there's no marriage or giving in marriage in heaven, she said, amen, loud and clear, and her husband was sitting right next to her. <laughs> Very kind of a gruff guy. And I came home and shared that with my wife, asked her what she thought about that. She didn't say anything at all. And she said, well, you know, the Bible says you're not married or giving in marriage in heaven. I said, well, can we at least be best friends in heaven, right? I'm, I'm hoping for that. It's hard to kind of imagine what existence will be like, but that existence is going to be centered around Christ and his call for our lives. But here's the bottom line. There's no marriage, but we're all related together in the community of faith. We're, we're all children of God. We're all brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. It's like a heavenly community. We'll recognize the existence we had together on the planet, but we'll also recognize in this greater way the community we have in heaven forever and ever and ever. We are eternal. The second word is the word pure. Somebody say pure. Somebody else say it. Pure. That's what we are. We're pure. Look at verse 43. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. So while our bodies are recognizable and imperishable, we're also sinless and pure and glorious. There is no dishonor. There's no sin. There's no rebellion, which is something that we couldn't escape here on the planet. We'll be free from guilt and the disappointment of guilt and from grief of falling short of God's desire for us. In fact, not only will our bodies be glorious, we're clothed in glorious garments as well. Someone says, well, I thought we would be like in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve didn't have clothes. They were naked and not ashamed. But the Bible says in every indication of heaven, we will have garments. We will be, we will be clothed. Revelation chapter 3, verse 5, he who overcomes thus will be clothed in righteous garments or white garments. And then in Revelation chapter 7, verse 9, after these things, John said, I looked and behold a great multitude clothed in white robes. Now, those robes are not just given simply to cover our, our bodies, but as a reminder that everything we have is placed on us by Jesus. His grace is what gets us to heaven. His righteousness is why we're there. His goodness clothes us, and that's why we are in that very presence of God. These white robes say our Lord gave us righteousness, so we are pure. The third word that describes our bodies is the word powerful. Somebody say powerful. It says we're raised, or rather planted, or sown in weakness and raised in power. Now, this is where it gets interesting. Because according to this passage, you will be limitless and powerful in a way you aren't now. The word powerful here, or power, is the word dunamis, where we get our English word dynamite. It's explosive power that ye will in your body have power you could never have imagined on earth. And I, I love that concept. You know, I'm a, I'm a former athlete. I love to watch athletic competitions. I love a great track meet. I love to watch the best sprinters in the world running hard for that finish line. I, I love, love to watch a four-by-four four relay where they're running the laps and uh, handing the batons, and I love the beauty of the athlete that's running so fast. I've never been that type of athlete. I've never run that speed. It's beyond my ability. But when I think about that, I think about a glorified body that's even more powerful than even the greatest athletic competitor on the planet. And well, even beyond that. Because we'll be raised in power, the Scripture says. There's all kinds of power. And I think that's a pretty important thing for us to begin to think about. We'll have the power to do all we want to do. We'll not need rest in heaven. We won't grow tired in all of our activities. We'll be able to explore all of God's new creation. You say, well, what is God's new creation? 
Well, if you read the book of Revelation, you'll realize that God is creating a brand new heaven and a brand new earth. And in the same way our glorified bodies are so much greater than our earthly bodies, so the new heaven and new earth will be so much greater than the present earth. Can you imagine with me what that means to see a greater Grand Canyon? Can you imagine something greater than Mount Everest? Can you imagine greater constellations and solar systems and to explore them, to be amazed by the God who created them? And we won't have to line up at the airport to get on a plane to go there. We'll just go because we're raised in power. We have the ability to travel at will and to fully function in eternity. Now, your body was made just right for your existence on planet Earth, but your new body will be, be made just right to exist uh, to, and function on the new heaven. It's going to be an amazing body that God gives you to do all the things that you need to do in heaven and in glory. The fourth word is the word, the word free. Somebody say free. Free. It's free. Not free in the sense of not costing anything because it did cost the life of Jesus to get you there, but free in the sense of unencumbered. Look in verse 44. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. In heaven, our resurrected bodies are free and unencumbered, unburdened by natural limitations. Now, that means everything you think it does. We're free from the physical, natural limitations, such as the laws of gravity and spiritual limitations like lust and sin. We're no longer confined to the natural anymore. Now, think about what confines our ability to see, our ability to hear, our ability to be mobile. All those things are confined on this planet. We can only see too far. We can only hear so much. And then some of us can't see and can't hear and are not mobile. You remember when Jesus was on the earth, he was doing all these amazing miracles. And if you summarize the ministry, blind people would see, deaf people heard, the lame walked. People were actually raised from the dead. People who had their entire lives dominated by physical limitation, all of a sudden they were whole on earth in the ministry of Jesus. Well, take that picture. That's just a seed of what your glorified body is, totally unlimited in every way. There will be no problem seeing everything, hearing everything, being mobile in every way. But above and beyond that, being free from earthly limitations as well and the natural laws that confine us. And Jesus was able to materialize at will. He went through locked doors on Resurrection Day and stood in the midst of the disciples, shocking them all. He did it again a week later just for Thomas. He could also disappear. Some of you are going to walk out of here saying, that preacher is crazy. He's talking about appearing here and there and going instantaneously, uh, being able to travel in the body in a way that nobody else could ever conceive. But that's exactly what the Bible describes. And that's exactly what Jesus did. In Luke chapter 24, verse 31, he's walking next to two men on the road to Emmaus, and he's in his glorified body. It says, then their eyes were opened, they recognized him, and then he vanished from them their sight afterwards. So he's there one moment, he's gone the next. He's free from natural limitations, time, space, and matter, which are our boundaries of the earthly existence, do not confine us in our resurrection bodies. Remember the ascension of Jesus, Acts chapter 1? At the very end of dealing with his disciples, the Bible says Jesus ascended up into heaven. Acts chapter 1, verse 9, after he had said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Now the disciples were looking at this, and they were staring at Jesus, having elevated into the sky, and they were just staring and staring. And finally an angel comes along and says, why are you staring into the sky? This Jesus that left in this manner will come back in the same way. So we know Jesus has done all these things. We're told that we'll be like him. And what Jesus did in the physical resurrection of his body will also be possible for us in this resurrected body. So we're free from all physical confinement, but we're also free from the mental confinement. Listen, we are confined mentally. I'm not saying, saying that we're mentally ill. I'm saying we're mentally shortchanged because we can't comprehend. Do you understand everything that's ever happened to you? Do you comprehend how one thing can be in existence at the same time as another? 
Can you comprehend why injustice is not spoken about or dealt with by God in heaven at this moment? Don't you have questions that need answers? All of us do. And we don't understand all that God is doing and has done. But can you imagine the ability to comprehend and to understand and to grasp and to know all those things we wanted to know so badly? 1 Corinthians 13 tells us that we know in part, but then we'll know fully, just as we're fully known. I'm looking forward to that. I mean, I think it's great. I'm going to have a glorified body, and you're going to have a glorified body, free from limitations, but I really want to understand some things that I do not understand right now. I want to know why about this and about that. I want to understand how God was able to weave all that together. But when I'm in my glorified state, when I'm in my resurrected state, I'm going to look back, and it's all going to make sense because God is going to make it make sense to me and my mind and my spirit and you as well. Wow, that's powerful. But because we're not merely natural anymore, we won't look at each other the same way. You won't be jealous of anybody else, angry at anybody else. You won't look for revenge. You won't feel superior or you won't feel inferior. You won't lust after anybody anymore. Gone are all the hurtful qualities that are tied to and rooted in selfishness. All that is gone. We're free from all that keeps us from being like Christ in our glorified body. We're simply God's people. We're simply spending eternity and enjoying eternity with each other and with Christ. That's a great picture. I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to dying so that I might have that resurrected body. Then there's one final trait, and it's the last one here in verse 49, and I describe it with this word, Christ-like. Somebody say Christ-like. Christ-like. Just as we have borne the image of the earthy, we will also bear the image of the heavenly. You know what Paul's saying, of course, is you bear the image of Adam, created from the dust of the ground, conceived in sin with a sin nature. You bore that all the time that you were on the planet. That's what you needed to be saved from. That's why Christ died on the cross, to pay for your sin. But then you will bear the image of the heavenly. It won't be made of dust. It'll be heavenly. It'll be made of Christ. That's a powerful thing. To the same degree that we've been from the dust from Adam on, we now will be completely from the heaven through Christ. There's a line in uh, Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 that came to my mind this past week. It's, it's this one. It says, He, that is Christ, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn among all creation. Now, this is, this is difficult for me to fathom when it comes to applying it to myself and to you. But Paul says in the same way that Jesus bore God's image and reflected his nature will reflect Christ's image and nature. Now, hear me clearly. We don't become God's. We are not God. He is God. But we do reflect his Christ-like, his godly qualities. We do reflect his image and his character. I know some people on this planet who are incredibly spiritual people, and you do too. They're so Christ-like. Their, their characteristics are so much like God. They're so patient, so loving, so merciful. They know truth so well, and yet they would be quick to say, man, I'm far from being what I need to be. Well, when they die and they meet Christ, he will complete their spirituality until they're absolutely perfect. And then the rest of us who are not quite where they are, we'll all be made whole and complete. We don't become God, but we become reflectors of the divine God of all creation. God will complete that process, and you'll have glorified and resurrected bodies. Now, listen, God has something incredible ahead of you. He has something incredible waiting for you, every one of you. It involves an amazing place. It involves an amazing body. It involves an amazing community. But for us to have that, we have to trust him now. You've got to trust him now. You have to trust him now to bring forgiveness of sins and to change your life right now. And when you do that, you trust him also for all eternity. It's all connected. All the future is connected to the decisions that we make right now in what we do with Jesus Christ. I'll tell you, the dramatic difference is not only in how we face death, but the dramatic difference is what happens to us at death. Because at death, those who are in Christ 
meet him face to face, and ultimately receive his glorified body that Paul describes. And for all eternity, we walk with him, worship him, commune with him and the saints. There's one verse I want to leave you with today. That's an important verse, Colossians or Philippians chapter 1, verse 5. Paul is saying this. He says about the church at Philippi, he says, I want you to grow. I want you to become more like Christ. He said, but I'm confident of this very thing, that he that began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. You know what that means? It means that God ultimately has that day appointed when he's returning, and he'll complete the process of making us just like Jesus. But until then, we let him work on our lives, our hearts, our minds, our walk, so that we can become more and more like Jesus. And whatever gaps will be there when he returns or when we die, he'll make up for with his goodness, his grace, with his person. And we will be completed and perfected on that day. Those that love Christ, they want that. They look ahead to that. The Bible says that everybody that fixes their hope on him purifies himself as we fix our hope on him. Now, I don't know what your plans are after death, but I highly suggest that this is the best plan going. I highly suggest that you look at what he promises instead of what anybody else tries to promise you in terms of life and death and beyond. There's simply nothing better nor will there ever be. I want you to bow your head for just a moment. As I conclude the, the message here with prayer in a moment, I'm going to invite you. As you make your way out of the building, there are decision stations that are lit up at the back, and you'll be able to see them. There are people that man those stations, willing to pray with you, talk with you, answer questions that you may have. And I would say that this morning, if you're looking ahead in your life, and you've not made the decision to allow Jesus to be Lord and Savior of your life, that's the decision you need to start with. Because none of the things I talk about today are possible for someone without Christ. There's a whole different destination for those without Christ. Do you have Christ? You know, in, in a moment, I'm going to pray a prayer that is the kind of prayer you'd pray if you want to put your faith and trust in Christ. And I urge you to do that today. And then don't waste time to go tell somebody at that decision station, I invited Christ into my life today. Would you stand with me? And as you stand, I'm going to pray that prayer. And that prayer is not only a time of conclusion of our service, but an opportunity for you to put your faith and trust in Christ. Before I pray that prayer, I also want to invite any of you that are visiting here, maybe you're here for the first time or the first few times, we have a guest reception center right outside the center exit door and across the hallway. And I want you to make that spiritual decision first. They'll tell you where guest reception is after that. But today I invite all of you to take just a moment. Let me meet you. Let me talk to you for just a moment. That's an important kind of moment that we can have together. Let's bow together. I'm going to pray the prayer that will be important for you if you want to put your faith and trust in Christ. Father, in Jesus' name today, hear us as we pray. I know there are those in the room today that are at that point of decision. They're at a crossroads. They're hearing about the future. And their own future that they think about is not as promising. And they know they need you. Hear them as they pray this very simple prayer. And here's the prayer you would pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I know that I need my sins forgiven. I know Jesus died on the cross to pay for them. Today I ask you to forgive me of my sin. I turn away from that to follow you. I ask you to give me the gift of eternal life. I choose to follow you from this day forward. I trust my future in your hands. I thank you for this gift. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless.